Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Penny Pitcher Firearms. Uh, today I'm just doing a talking head about my lovely 1863 Sharps carbine. Now you've seen me shoot it, but you haven't seen too much in the way of me actually doing any close-ups on it. So why don't I actually bring the camera around and we'll take a look at how this thing actually works because I think it's a really interesting gun. Okay, we are now on my my cleaning mat, which is actually an old sheet. Uh, you can see some of the staining on it and stuff. I actually got this in the mail from somebody who wrapped a uh, rifle stock in it. So, yeah, this is not my sheet. I don't. I, I have slept with it in the, in the past, but really, it's become just like my uh, my cleaning setup. So, here's the sharps. Uh, let's go over some features first before we actually get into disassembly. Uh, the Sharps, as you know already, is a falling breech uh, loading rifle. It's fairly simple. Uh, it's operated with the use of this lever down here that lowers this breech. So all you do really is pull it down and it opens the breech for you. You load right there, close it up, put a nipple on there. This is a stainless steel nipple. Pull back the hammer and fire. It's a stainless steel nipple, so I'm not really worried about that getting beaten up too bad. Another thing is it actually has a nice ladder sight. It's graduated out to 800 yards. I really doubt <laughs> this gun is actually going to get to that point. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I, I've finally figured out the accuracy issues with it where mostly my powder loads were a bit too hot. Uh, so, um, but I, I really doubt you're going to get maybe past 300 yards with any level of accuracy. So, that's that. <laughs> now, the front sight is kind of a sad arrangement. It's very simple. It's basically just a front blade, but the blade is so tiny, it's nearly impossible to see through the rear sight. But, I mean, the notch back here in the rear sight is not so great either. So, that's that's one shortcoming for this rifle is that the the sights are not the best. They're they're precise. I'll say that. Uh you know, the smaller the sight, the more precise the shot. But really, in the end, uh, I would have preferred to have more visible sights. But, you know, 1850s design, whatever. Now, another thing it has is a lever locking device right here. That's this thing. You press down this button right here and push forward. And that keeps the lever from being opened, uh, most likely for when it was being carried. You didn't want to have this thing knocking around and all of a sudden it opens up on you and, you know, your powder's all over the place. It would make for a very unpleasant situation, especially if you have a slug stuck in the barrel. It's not going to be the easiest thing to take out without firing it. So, yeah. As I said before, there is no uh, patch box in the buttstock of the 1863 model. 1859 model does have a patch box. That's really the only major difference between the two. Carbine models will have this loop right here, which is for a sling. Now, this one should have a ring on it sometime in the past. Uh, whoever had it um, probably took the ring off and tossed it. You could still put a sling on here. All it is is a nice snap ring sling. So you could probably put it directly on there and it wouldn't be a problem. So let's get to disassembly. So I'm going to zoom out a tad and get my multi-tool, my Swiss Army knife. Now, I'll use this on most of my guns. I know there's going to be people out there that are going to flip out because I'm using, you know, steel on steel and it's going to scratch things up and you're going to mar the finish and all that business. Guys, it's my gun. Leave me alone. If you have your own gun, treat it the way you want to treat it, but it's my gun. Back off. Seriously. So, that's that's going to be my tool today. Just thought I had to explain that. So, first thing you want to do when disassembling the sharps is put it at half cock and unlock 
the lever if it's locked. It's very easy, you just push it back and it gets it out of the way. Pull down on the lever, make sure that your breech is empty. This one is, obviously. Close it again. Then there's a small button here. Let's get in real close here. See that button right there? What you do is you press that in. Now this isn't really something you have to have, by the way, uh, locked in place behind this little button, but I prefer to do it. So what you're doing is pushing this disassembly lever out and past that plunger. Take it to 180 degrees like that and pull it straight out. What that does, that's actually the, uh, the hinge pin that the breech block is riding on. So it has a tendency to get on that lock right here. So just be careful of that. And the whole assembly for the breech should come out. Fairly simple. So for cleaning purposes, that's really all you need to do. This is the breech block. This is probably the most important part of the rifle. And it can be further disassembled. I'm not actually going to take the whole thing apart because it's a pain in the butt. Um, but most of these things are fairly easy to take off. It's really putting it back together that's the issue. So this lever has basically a, a, I guess it's a linkage right here. It's a link rod with a hinge here and a hinge here. So if I bring it in closer, you can see there's a screw here and a screw here. Now, removing this screw allows this lever to be taken off along with that linkage right here. So that, that will allow you to get in there and clean all the powder residue out of there if it gets really dirty. I haven't had too many issues with that. I can usually just uh, scrub it out. It's not terrible. Uh, that's really it for taking the lever off for cleaning. Another thing that's actually kind of important to get off and clean is this plate right here. Now this plate is made of a special alloy from what I'm told. Uh, I could be wrong about it. But what it does is you have in here kind of a odd shape where it's essentially a cone and the narrowest part is facing us. And what happens is as the combustion occurs, gases get into that cone, expand out, and push against the breech of the rifle and this creates a seal. Now you'll notice there's some rusting right there and that rust can actually allow some of the gases to get out. So I, I hear that um, it can be a big issue after a while. It has gotten powder all over my hands before and uh, usually I wear long sleeves but I have once burned my, my arm uh, with some of the gases that escape. Even with a perfect breech lo uh, block uh, this plate still is going to leak gases. It's just you know a matter of course it's going to happen. Uh, what you can see here too is your flame path. This is the uh, the nipple. Like I said, it's made of stainless steel. The primer is placed here and it's struck. Well, the flame has to move down this way and this way. That's a long flame path. That's why a lot of these don't shoot very well with uh, black powder substitutes because they're not nearly as sensitive to flame. So that's why I was in my first video with this rifle putting powder in the nipple. Well, shooting with black powder, I haven't had a single problem, and I've actually been shooting lower powder uh, charges of 60 grains and getting significantly more accurate shots. Next thing we can do is actually remove the locking work, which is not very hard to do. All you have to do is remove two screws right here. Placement screws, so this thing's super valuable. I'm sure somebody just cringed seeing me scratch the finish. That comes out like that you'll see that I've greased it up pretty good in there um, it's important to grease things especially in a black powder gun uh, the grease doesn't really lubricate it encapsulates so it ensures that the uh, black powder residue doesn't get all over everything now yes it is less likely in fact it's very unlikely for the black powder residue to get into the lock work of this particular rifle but I thought you know it keeps some of the moisture out as well and just keeps everything running nice and smooth. So the way the trigger works 
in this is actually kind of interesting. So the trigger is not part of the lock work, as is the case in most of these older rifles. But what it does is it has the trigger up here, but it's actuated over here on a rod. This rod goes into that hole and is pushed on by the trigger. So that's kind of a, a neat little thing to point out. Uh, beyond this point, really, uh, disassembly is completely unnecessary. Uh, removing the tangs and everything, uh, taking off the stock, that really wasn't, wouldn't prove much of anything. Uh, and there's not much going on in there after this point, other than the lock here and the trigger just sitting on its pin. So, uh, one thing I will point out in a little bit is something on the, the uh, four stock. So here we have the lock. Here we go. So the lock is pretty typical of the time period. Most of the uh, percussion rifles and uh, flintlock rifles of the 1800s worked in essentially the same fashion. It has, right now it's at half cock and then it has a full cock. It has this here spring and this spring is what runs the hammer. The trigger, if I press up on it, will let the hammer go. Uh, you'll notice I slowed it down back here. I didn't want it to slam down on this piece of metal here and mess that up too bad. And you can see, if we get even closer, I'm gonna, there we go. I'm gonna bring it to half cock. And you'll notice half cock has kind of like this little this little ledge come on focus this little ledge right here that holds the sear in place that's what this is really is the sear this right here and full cock obviously does not have that little lip and so that will allow it to fire so that is essentially your safety. That and not having a percussion cap on the, uh, the nipple until you absolutely need it. Other than that, there's not much stopping it from firing. But I would, I would trust it for the most part, unless you dropped it really hard. Uh, it seems reasonably safe. I've been able to push on it as hard as I can. Um, I will say trigger's pretty heavy and it's probably because uh, it's not been shot a whole lot. The The guy who owned it before uh, supposedly was a uh, reenactor so I'm imagining he only shot it on occasion. Now you'll notice on there if you can read it try and get it real close it says Sharps Patent October 1852 uh, and that's I believe for a lot of the uh, the kind of intricacies of the lock work but I mean otherwise this is really nothing special so the last thing we'll go over is there is a spring under here and what that spring does is act as resistance to the lever so when you're when you're loading it, it actually resists the uh, the downward force of you pulling the lever. That way, when it fires, the uh, the breech doesn't fly open, which is very unlikely anyway. It also makes it so it's very unlikely for the breech to open under motion, uh, being jostled around, that kind of thing. So I thought it would be important to, to show you this spring, because if this spring fails, the gun fails. So first thing you need to do is get this barrel band off, which is not hard. You just press there get that out of the way get my special tool undo this screw take that screw out and the grip just comes right off now uh, you'll notice this part will get powder on it just because there's an opening back here uh, this plate tries to protect it, but there's still going to get some black powder residue in there. So I've got a little bit of rust. I'm going to have to clean that up later, but nothing too bad. But 
that's how the spring looks and to replace it it's very simple you just unscrew it right here take it off along with this plate and then put a new one in easy as that okay so you guys have seen how everything comes apart and I didn't want to put you through the, uh, the hassle of seeing me put everything back together because um, I have found in the past, and it proved itself correct again today, that some of these screws are a little fiddly. Uh, they don't quite like to go in properly, and I, I hear that that's something that was an issue with a lot of the IAB Sharps rifles. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons why IAB did not last forever. Um, that I have been told that IAB uh, was not well known for good quality, uh, but for the most part, I would say this is a pretty decent quality gun. I'm pleased with it. Um, I'm not. I'm not in love with it. I'm not. I don't think I'm ever going to be married to this gun. Uh, it can always go if I need some money or something. But it is. It is a pretty cool gun to have. I've enjoyed shooting it despite all of its quirks. It has been a learning experience because, as you've seen. It's not super accurate uh, when you're using the, uh, the black powder substitutes. It's also very hard to shoot the black powder substitutes. So, you know, it, it was important for me to have this lesson in using the proper powders for the, for the, the gun. Uh, you know, the substitutes work great for the revolvers, but you really need the real thing, the real deal for one of these Sharps rifles. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, if you liked it, press like, subscribe, uh, just, you know, enjoy the videos. I love showing this stuff. I love teaching. Um, and you know what? If you, uh, if you happen to be in my area, let's go shooting. So just remember, guys, good gun doesn't always have to cost a pretty penny.